Good morning again. Glad to be here with you. We're walking through Philippians and uh, I feel like we were moving along at a really good clip through Philippians and then we hit like chapter three and it was like going on a road trip with your dad and you had to like stop and see everything along the way and even anybody have that experience and so we're, we're like in Philippians four and so we're slowing down which is great. Philippians four has some great stuff in it and so we're in Philippians four chapter or verses eight through nine and as I was looking at it this week, uh, we're talking about having a new focus today, which was ironic because I found myself incredibly distracted as I was preparing for this week. And I wound up looking in, in, a, in a part of the world I never really think about too much, and that's in the world of art. I started looking at art. I get uh, why people find art appealing. I appreciate like the aesthetics components of it, but I'm not like an artistic person. I'm not an artist. I, I, don't, I don't have uh, that sort of bone in my body. But I wound up looking at the David, uh, the statue of, of, that Michelangelo sculpted in the 1600s, the, the David, right? And uh, it's like a 17-foot tall uh, a statue of uh, David, King David, before he was King David, uh, about to fight Goliath. And what I learned was that uh, when Michelangelo sculpted this, he was 29 years old, and it kind of cemented, no pun intended, his place in being the, one of the, the greatest sculptors at all time. Even his contemporaries recognized how amazing the statue was. When he was 26, he did La Pieta, and then when he was 29, he did uh, the David, which led me to one uh, very uh, startling conclusion. I began to look at my own life at 38 and wondered, what have I done with the years that I have been given? He was making these amazing things by the time he was 29, and here I am at 38, and I have no marble statues to show for it yet. Yet. <laughs> So we ask the question, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? And I think you ask these questions a lot, but I think the times you ask them the most are during times of transition, in times of transition in your life. Because you enter into a new stage, whether it's, it's welcoming a child, whether it's getting married, whether it's getting a new job, whether it's leaving behind a career, going back to school, whatever, you enter into a new phase of life, maybe it's entering into retirement, and you begin to ask yourself, what is it that I need to bring with me and what is it that I need to leave behind? What do I need to focus on to make this new stage of my life worthwhile? And what do I need to ignore so as it's not a distraction to this new part of life? And so we're going to answer that question today, looking at Philippians 4, verses 8 through 9. What should I focus on and what should I ignore? And it's really going to be two questions. Is it worthy of praise and is it worthy of practice? And if it's worthy of praise and worthy of practice, then it's something worthwhile. And if it's not, then we can ignore it. So let's talk about what makes something worthy of praise. Verse 8 of Philippians 4. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, uh, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And so in the last passage, in uh, verse 7 and, and, and before, Paul has told us that if we're worried, if we're anxious, not to be anxious about anything, and, and to go to the Lord in thanksgiving and supplication, and the peace of God will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And what he's telling us now is, what then do you do with a heart and a mind that's guarded with God's peace? What you do is you think about certain things. You spend time contemplating because you don't have to worry about the anxious stuff because you've surrendered your life to Christ. You've surrendered your fears and your concerns to him. So now you have all this free space in your brain to think about something. What do you do with all that brain power? And Paul's saying, you think about things that are just and commendable and praiseworthy things. Praiseworthy things. And I think it's one of the reasons why I wound up looking at the David. Because regardless of your taste in art or, or even your taste in, in subject matter, you can at least look at the David and be like, man, that is a, an absolute spectacle. That's beautiful. That's commendable. That's praiseworthy. That's an amazing piece of art. And so what I want us to do is I want us to take this David that we can kind of universally agree is, is worthy of praise and use it as a lens, maybe a jumping off point for thinking about what should we find praiseworthy? What's the criteria for things that are praiseworthy? And the first thing I would say is that the praiseworthy things praise the original. They praise the original. Did you know that the David is not the only David in existence? There are replicas. There's one in New York. Uh, I think that's a bronze one. That's in, I think it's in Central Park. Maybe not in Central Park, but there's a bronze one there. Uh, there's one in France, and there's also one in England. Fun fact about the one in England, it comes uh, equipped with a detachable fig leaf because it unsettled Queen Victoria a little bit. So it came equipped with something else, some, some attachments. And then there's also one in the uh, the the park, the plaza in Florence, where it was originally supposed to be, 
And then there's the original that's inside of a building. It's inside of a building. And then, of course, there's pictures online. You can do a Google search of the David. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can easily pull out your phone and look up Michelangelo's David, and and you'll have tons of pictures there. What's cool about all this stuff is I don't have to go to Florence to appreciate the amazing magnitude and beauty of the David. Now, obviously, being in person would be better. I can't say that I've seen the David But the truth of the matter is, I can actually look and see and observe and appreciate the beauty because it's all pointing back to the original. And this is what Paul's telling us here. You don't have to actually look directly at the glory of God in order to appreciate his manifold greatness, his perfections, his beauty. There are other things in the world that point us back to the creator. That's what the, the creation is for. The creation is supposed to point us to the creator. Paul says to think about whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is just, what's commendable, excellent, or praiseworthy because God epitomizes those qualities. Those things are supposed to point us to him. He's the standard by which we measure those things. There's even an apologetic for arguing for the existence of God based on the concept of beauty. The fact that we find something beautiful should tell us that a supreme beauty exists. A supreme beauty exists. Now, there are a couple of criteria that go into finding things that point to the original, right? Because there are things you can find beautiful and pure and good and commendable, but may not be, uh, get us all the way to honoring the Lord. One, we have to find something that meets all of the criteria. Something can't be commendable or just, but ugly. It needs to be, it needs to be all of these things. It needs to be true. It can't just be beautiful. It has to be true. So it has to be all of these things. It can't just be one or two. The other thing is it has to be done in a way in which God intends for it to be done. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the human body is beautiful. It's good, right? I know we all have uh, different opinions of the way we look, right? All of us are not happy. None of us, I guess, are happy. My wife told me this morning, nobody's happy with their hair. And I was like, I don't know. I think there's some people out there that have really great hair (laughs) and are happy with it. So God made our bodies and he made them good. But in certain contexts, it's not appropriate to celebrate the human body, right? That's the idea behind pornography, right? It's it's, it's human bodies not being used the way God intended them to be used. And so we have to think about the way God intends for things to be used. And this is a biblical concept. This idea of something pointing us heavenward, this idea of something that's physical, that's present before us, pointing us to something that's spiritual. In Hebrews 8, verse 5, this is going to seem strange because it's out of context, but I'll explain it. The author says, they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. Now, what's going on? The writer of Hebrews is basically walking you through uh, uh, all the Old Testament saying Jesus is better than anything in the Old Testament. He's better than angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than the priesthood. And so we're right about this discussion on the priesthood. And he's saying there was this thing called the tabernacle, which is what the Ark of the Covenant and, and God's presence was, was located in the tabernacle before they built the temple. It was a tent. And so they, they put the Ark there and that's where God's presence dwelt. And God actually determines that it should be made in a certain fashion. It should be made in a certain way. So Moses goes up on the mountain, he gets the Ten Commandments, and he gets directions on how to build a tent. They don't just go to Camping World and find something. They actually build it. They actually make it. And it's supposed to point us to the heavenly throne room. This tent is supposed to remind you of the throne room of God himself. And God is so serious about it, he takes two guys, he points them out, Oheliab and Bezalel, if you're pregnant and you're looking for some names for your kids, might I suggest, Oheliab and Bezalel. And they're craftsmen, they're, they're blue collar guys, they're workers. And God says, I've got those two guys picked out, I've had my hand on them, and I'm gonna use them to craft everything that's gonna go in the tabernacle, everything that's gonna be used, and the tabernacle itself, it's all gonna be superintended and, and used by these, or, or made by these two guys. And so God takes two men, very common human beings, with a common skill set. They're craftsmen. Every culture had craftsmen in that day and age. We have craftsmen now. And he uses them to make something that would point people's attention to heaven. 
And this leads us to whatever your gifts, whatever your talents, whatever your abilities, whatever your affinities and affections, God can use those things to point to the creator. The good things, the things that are praiseworthy aren't just supposed to point to the fact that, oh, that's cool, good job. No, it's supposed to point you to the creator. Praise God for the, the talents and abilities that we have. And see, the difference between an idolater, someone who makes idols, and somebody who makes things that point them to God, is where does the worship stop? Does it stop at the thing made? Does it stop at the, the person creating it? Or does it take us all the way to the heavenly being? Does it take us to Jesus Christ? Does it take us to God himself? That's the difference between idolatry and something that's genuinely praiseworthy. This is why we pray over our food. I don't have to pray over my food to, to, for it to be nutritious. I don't have to pray over that. Now there's some debate as to whether or not you need to pray over the chips and salsa before you eat them. I feel like spiritually that's a gray area. So I'll let you kind of determine, let the Lord's conscience guide you. But we bless our food, why? Because we're giving thanks to the one who gave it to us. We pray in our services, why? Why do we close our eyes and bow our heads and pray in a service? Because it's not about the music. It's not about the person up here talking. It is about honoring the Father. And all of us are guilty of constructing idols. That's why we have to reorient back to the Lord. This is why we give. This is why there's a call to give. Because it's not about what we have. It's about taking what we have and magnifying and glorifying God. I was listening to a sermon uh, this week by a guy named George Mueller. He was well known for, for being, uh, starting a bunch of orphanages in, um, in England in the late 1800s. And he never, he, they were always like needing money, right? There's just always. And he never asked the Lord. He never, he never uh, asked the, uh, he never uh, asked for money. He never went around and begged for money or, or did fundraising or anything like that. The Lord just brought it. Asked him for it. He asked for it and got it. It's amazing. It's amazing. Praiseworthy things point us to our creator. Praiseworthy things also tell the truth. You know what's unique about the David? Most people that sculpt the David or have painted the David do him after the battle with Goliath. So there's always this picture of like a severed head and David holding it. Like you can tell a bunch of dudes decided to paint this scene. Like they're like, yeah, check this out. You got a severed head, that's cool. But David, or Michelangelo, sculpts him before the battle. And so if you look at his face, there's concern. His brow's furrowed, he's, he's nervous, he's anxious. And you might say, well, Travis, it doesn't paint that picture in the scriptures. He seems very confident. Yes, of course he's confident. He's the Lord on his side. He's down there in faith. But the story would be kind of unamazing if David was just walking into the valley completely without any kind of concern at all, right? And on top of that, you're sculpting only one figure in this, this drama that we know as David and Goliath. You have to somehow communicate that, David, that Goliath is scary. And so you put it on the face of David. It makes a lot of sense. And we resonate with that. We, we identify with Facing a giant and being scared. The David connects with me on that level. Because it's true. It's true. And this is why Paul tells us to think about whatever's true. Because there are a ton of lies out there. You just turn on the TV, you watch commercials and advertisements. And they want you to believe if you buy this product, if you eat this thing, if you drink this thing, if you go this place, if you wear these clothes, you're going to be popular or successful or, or financially sound. You're going to have all these things. Life's going to be great. And while probably some of that's true, they probably exaggerate just a bit. But they're lies. And we believe lies, right? We tell lies to ourselves all the time. We think we're bigger than we are. We think we're smaller than we are. We think we're smarter than we are. We think we're dumber than we are. Probably the biggest lie we tell ourselves is that we're better people than we actually are. One of the biggest barriers, I would say maybe the biggest barrier to you having a thriving relationship with the Lord is that we keep running back to our own righteousness instead of running to his. Because we buy this lie that we're good people. Good people. That's our bar for being successful is just be a good person. That is not what God requires of us. And so this is why we've been called to think about whatever is true. Because it's hard. There's a lot of lies out there. 
We've got to take everything we say, everything we take in through the lens of integrity. Is this honest? Is it genuine? More than that, does it line up with the truth of Scripture? Does it line up with what Scripture's taking me? Because I can go with this verse 8, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, all that, but I'm not going to know what those things really are if I'm not in the Word of God. God tells us what those things actually are. Because something can feel true. It can feel good. It can feel right and be wrong. Think about the David again. The David is amazing. It's a beautiful sculpture, 17 feet tall. It looks incredible. Did you know it's not perfect? The head and the hand are actually disproportionately large. We don't really know why, but if you were to be a 17 foot tall person, one, NBA, go check it out. But two, if you were to be a, a 17 foot tall person, you could not have the dimensions that the David has. It's unrealistic, but it looks so good. It looks so real. It looks like a real person just made out of marble. It looks like David could just all of a sudden step down off that pedestal at any moment. But it's not real. Things can look and feel real. They can feel true and be the blackest of lies. Your eyes and your heart will deceive you. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. So if there are praiseworthy things, praiseworthy things are going to point you to the truth. They're going to point you back to Jesus. They're going to point you back to the gospel story of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And then you think about how you can live that story out in your life. Because again, we operate a lot on feeling. We're forgiving when we feel like it. That's not living a gospel-oriented life. People who do not follow Christ forgive when they feel like it. We forgive when we don't feel like it. We forgive when it damages us. We forgive like our Lord did when we're hanging on a cross, dying, we forgive. It's why we apologize, even before we're confronted. If you're a follower of Christ, I'm sorry should be a part of your vocabulary. Confession and repentance. You should seek a life of integrity. Who you are in private should be who you are in public. Praiseworthy things are true. Praiseworthy things point us to the creator, to the original. And praiseworthy things are beautiful. The bottom line is we love the David because it's beautiful. It's gorgeous, right? The thing that I find most amazing about the David is the hair. Like, again, he's made of marble and he has better hair than I do. (laughs) And when I have hair product in, we basically both have marble hair, let's be honest. (laughs) It is one of the most beautiful things in the world. That was made by a human hand, the David. Paul tells us whatever is lovely to think about. Think about those things. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean anything physically appealing? No, it doesn't mean just physically appealing things. Gordon Fee, a commentator that I read, tells us that this can mean anything that gives us joy, anything that makes our heart sing, anything that kind of makes your heart happy. And he uses this expression. He says, anything from Mozart to Mother Teresa falls in the category of lovely. So this can be music, movies, TV shows, sports, games, books, people, places. Paul's saying it's okay to enjoy these things. And what he's saying is when you become a Christian, there's this tendency that you, you, people think you become a monk, right? You've got to give up everything that, that you enjoy, right? You've got to become ascetic. And what Paul's saying here is actually taking a list. This list is not Judeo-Christian, by the way. This is a, a, a Hellenistic list. This is made by Greeks and Romans. And this list that he's putting together, he's saying, look, I took this thing, this list that was made by pagan philosophers, and I've repurposed it, I've redeemed it, and now I'm telling it, use this list to give God glory. And in the same way, there are beautiful things that maybe be a part of our old life that we can still hold on to as long as they meet the criteria. Now, if they get in the way of following Christ, they become an idol and you throw them away. But Paul's saying that our Lord is in the business of redemption. When we fell, he didn't throw us away. He's redeemed us. In the same way, there are things in our life that are good, that need to be redeemed. So how do I do this? What what does this look like? Well, say you love food, you love cooking. Do you share your food? When you cook, do you just cook for yourself? Or do you invite other people to use your table? If you love sports, do you worship the Lord through sports? Or are you just like the worst person ever to watch sports with? Are you an angry person when you watch sports? Look, it's baseball playoff season. I know all about being an angry person. 
What kind of person are you? Does, does the appreciation of athletics lead you yourself to be physically active? And again, I know most of us can't you know, run like a 440, but are you active? Because God is saying, hey, I've given you a body, use it. Do you love movies or TV? What do you watch? Is it redemptive? Or is it just dark and sinister? You might say, well, Travis, that's reality. Not my reality. I know things are dark sometimes, things are difficult, but I believe in a Lord who's gonna return and make all things right. And every injustice is gonna get made right. So I like movies with happy endings. You can call me naive, I don't care. At the end of the day, beautiful things have to be enjoyed in light of the creator. Otherwise, it's just idolatry. The reason why the David is so appreciated is because it points us to the genius of Michelangelo. And the genius of Michelangelo points us to the genius of our God who made him. And he made you. And he's a genius for it. Whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's commendable, if there's anything that's excellent, think about these things. So we, do we just stop at thinking about it? No, he keeps going. If it's worthy of praise, then it should also be worthy of practice. Now remember how I said that David is disproportionate in its head and its hands? Uh, again, as, as I said, nobody really knows why. Some people think because the David was originally supposed to be on uh, top of a building, uh, Michelangelo wanted people to be able to see certain features, so he made them larger. Other people think that because David's name means strong of hand, uh, according to some, uh, that the, uh, he made the hand larger as like a nod to his nickname. But because it's art and it's subjective, I can give it whatever meaning I want to. I had an art history class. I know what I can do. But it's a religious sculpture, right? And so when I look at the David, it reminds me, as I was looking at it this week, that really the David and its disproportions are mimicking the passage that we're talking about today. Paul is telling us here to think and to do. He's telling us to be disproportionate in our head and our hands, to think and then to do, to act, to think about the word of God, to think about the ways of the Lord, and then to work out the work of the Lord, to do those things. Good art points us to something else, to something greater, and that's what I think that David does. It does. So we talked about the first part, thinking about it. Let's talk about the second part, what to do. Verse nine, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So Paul, the Philippian church had a front row seat to Paul and his experiences. They've seen him be incredibly powerful. He's cast out demons in their presence. He's been uh, uh, basically broken out of jail and didn't go. All sorts of stuff have happened. And so they've seen it but they've also seen the suffering for it. They've seen him be arrested. They've seen him beaten. They saw all those things. They've seen the ridicule. And Paul's saying, yeah, whatever you've seen in me, whether I've taught it to you directly or whether you've seen it in my life, put it into practice. Don't just sit on your hands. Don't just think about it. You can't just stop at thinking about it. You've actually got to do it. And this is a tendency we have. We have a tendency to overthink things to think about things before we actually put them into practice. Following Christ is a matter of action as well as a matter of thought. Again, James tells us faith without works is dead, right? What you think about would be what you put into practice. Whatever occupies your thoughts, whatever your focus is, that's what you're going to do. Jesus tells us, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's the same concept. We think that we have to do things and then it'll change the way we think. No, it's what we think about that influences the way we act. We're in a meeting this week and Han Oh uh, made, a, made a comment about discipleship and he said it's lifestyle, it's whole life discipleship. It's not just momentary, it's not just once a week, it's not just here and there, it's whole life. It's bringing everything under, in your life under the subservience of the Lord. That's the work of a disciple and it's difficult. It's hard. Because each and every one of us has affinities and affections. We're disproportionate. Maybe put another way, if we had a sculptor here at Park Cities Baptist who was amazingly talented, but the, this person's gift was not to sculpt the way you looked physically, but they could make a sculpture of how you looked spiritually. 
If your spiritual uh, life was to take on physical form, what would your sculpture look like? Would you be, have a disproportionately large head with like a tiny baby body? Because you know all the answers, you know all the doctrine, you know all the theology, but you do nothing with it. You have no affection for the Lord at all. You just have some giant head. What about, maybe you have large hands and large feet. Because you're all about doing things. You stay busy, you stay at work. And you call it serving the Lord. But you only do it so that this God that you think is, is cruel and, and hard will be happy with you. And so you have no affection. You have a small heart. You have a small head because you don't think about him. Or maybe your sculpture would have large eyes and large hands because you're always seeing what everybody else has and you're grabbing for it. You're always looking and grabbing for what everybody else has because you want to be like everybody else. Or would your statue be like the David? Tall and strong, with broad shoulders. And yeah, a disproportionate head because you're thinking about what the Lord has given you to do. And you have disproportionate hands because you're, you're being led to serve and because you love him so much. What would your statue look like? And you might say, well, Travis, I don't know what my statue would look like. Well, there's a list that tells us how we can know. Galatians chapter five, verse 19 says this. Now the works of the flesh are evident Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Whatever your statue would look like is if your life looks like list one or list two. Our tendency is to view this as a list of rules. And there are a list of rules in the Bibles. There's vices and virtues list all throughout in the writings of Paul. But this is not one of them. This is not a go be more self-controlled. This is not a go learn to be kind. This isn't a go learn to be a, 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 a person that's, that's righteous. Don't, you don't, it's not what this is about. This is a diagnostic. Your existence, your existence as a human being, what does it produce? Does it produce the first list or the second? What is the side effect of your being in existence? Is it the first list or the second? And that'll tell you what your statue will look like. And this is where it becomes really counterintuitive because we cannot try to do these things better. You might hear this and be like, okay, well, I'm gonna go and be kind now or I'm gonna be self-controlled now. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what the scriptures are saying. Paul's saying, you go and you think about these things. You think about kindness. You think about self-control. You think about the list, goodness. And then what happens is you change. You know Why? Because our God, Jesus Christ, is the epitome of those things. He is this list. He is true. He is honorable. He is just. And so when we think about things that are like that, we begin to be shaped and conformed. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Why does it start there? I'll tell you why. Because what you think about is what you will do. If you go outside these walls and you try to be more kind... You might last a week. But if you go out of here thinking about the Savior who died for you, then you will begin to be the kindest person you know and it will grow and grow and grow. Just like the Michelangelo, or sorry, the David, was, it was created first in the mind of Michelangelo before anything, anybody ever saw anything else. He saw this in his mind's eye. Our God has an image of you in his mind, of what he wants you to be, to become, what he wants to sculpt you into. And you might sit there and say, Travis, it's hard. But you don't understand what I've been through. You don't understand my life. You don't understand uh, where I'm at in life. I'm set in my ways. I can't change. Let me tell you a little bit more about the David before you become so convinced you can't change. Two sculptors worked with the large block of marble because the David was made out of one block of marble. Two other sculptors, work, sculptors worked with it before Michelangelo got a hold of it. And they determined that it was too difficult to work with. 
And so it sat around for 40 years before Michelangelo got a hold of it. And some of you just resonated with a piece of marble that was difficult to work with and sat around for 40 years. A lot of us view ourselves as hard as marble, difficult to shape, unchanging, stubborn. And you say, Travis, I don't, either don't want to change or changing is too hard. Of course it's too hard. That's why you don't do it. That's why you give the hammer and the chisel to the Lord. That's why you stop trying to shape yourself, to mold yourself. You give it to him. Because here's how he will shape you. Are you ready? Because what Jesus did, he who is perfect, remember he's this entire list. He's true, he's honorable, he's just, he's pure. He who is perfect, Rather than take the hammer and chisel to us who are imperfect, he took the hammer and the chisel to himself and he put a chisel here and he put a chisel here and he put one through his feet. And rather than working with marble to build himself a palace, he worked with wood on a cross and he hung there to shape all of us stubborn pieces of marble that can't change. There's a greater Michelangelo and he's asking you to give him the hammer and give him the chisel. Will you do it? Will you trust him? He says, look at me. Because I'm going to make you like me. And you want to know what that's like? I'll tell you what I want to make you into. Jesus wants to make you true. He wants to make you honorable. He wants to make you just. He wants to make you pure and lovely and commendable. He wants to make you excellent, worthy of praise. And you know why he wants to do that? Because whenever anybody looks at you, they'll think about the greatness of God in the same way that when we look at the David, we think about how great Michelangelo was. You are to be the greatest sculpture that our Lord has made. And he did it by taking a hammer and chisel to himself first. And what's great about our Lord is those other sculptors, they started working with that piece of marble and they gave up on it. Our Lord tells us, he that started the work in you is faithful to complete what he started. He's not gonna give up on you. He's not gonna quit. He's gonna keep going. So you just put your faith in him. You trust him. You drop the hammer and the chisel. Whether you've never done that before, whether you've never experienced a relationship with him, stop trying to change yourself. It won't work. He wants to do it for you. And for those of us that have been believers for a while, we have a tendency to grab that hammer and chisel back when we think we've got a good idea of where the sculptor's going. Drop him. Give it back to him. You can trust him. You know why you can trust him? He spent about 30 years as a craftsman. He knows what he's doing. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you love us so much. You are gracious to us. You are worthy of praise and you are worthy of practice. Change our attitudes, change our minds, change our hearts. Give us a desire for you because sometimes we don't even desire you, we desire other things. Lord Jesus, sculpt us, sculpt me. Be more into your image. We love you. It's in your great name we pray, amen.